think Delia mentioned um, zoonotic diseases, and she mentioned that they cause food safety challenges, and she also mentioned that they affect human health. But somehow we lost this connection in the discussion. And I think on the agenda we meant to link food safety with uh, malnutrition and human health. So I wanted to bring it up a little bit and say that, yes, food safety risks do undermine nutri uh, nutrition, cause malnut contribute to malnutrition in children, and also affect human health. But the other thing she mentioned is that we don't wait for problems to happen for food safety. We can prevent food safety problems. So among the solutions that we should be looking at is how we can invest in food safety infrastructure that can build and sustain resilience. And the kind of infrastructure that I want to bring up here is infrastructure in surveillance. Surveillance so that you detect the problem early enough and you do something to prevent the problem from happening. And this can be at community level, it can also be at household level, and it can go beyond at what national level. And also investing in early warning systems. But again, the challenge with our countries has been that there is a lot of competition for resources. When you take the public health angle, we are competing with malaria, we are competing with HIV, and it's very difficult to make a justification for some of the zoonotic diseases and some of the food safety risks that cause malnutrition and other health-related problems. So increasingly what we need is evidence that can help policymakers to make that careful balance between the public health risks that we are dealing with. So I also wanted to mention that from our experience, it's worked very well when we sometimes approach it from the trade angle when we demonstrate an economic impact. And when you do that, you bring together the industry and the public sector, and they both participate in identifying the areas that need investments that will bring about a public health objective goal and a trade goal. And in that way, you also leverage private sector investments. Because when you have a sound surveillance system, or a sound food safety systems, it also facilitates trade. They have an interest. So I just wanted to bring them up and say that those are areas that we also need to look up as we try to increase investments in food safety infrastructure that can build and sustain surveillance serving both public health and trade objectives. Contrary to the argument that I heard yesterday, there should never be a conflict between public health, food safety, food safety view from a public health angle and from a trade angle. Because when you have a sound food safety system, it facilitates trade. That's what industry is looking for. But this balance somehow is never achieved. So, so let me, and Delia is not here. Um, <laughs> but let me, one of the things that she was supposed to talk about was um, this issue about the kind of convergence of economics and health when it comes to things like food safety systems, okay? So, um, you know, you can have a well-performing food safety system, but that, that's often in a context. But in a lot of the informal markets that we're looking at, we're really balancing a lot of different risks and trade-offs for people. So do they have access to markets? And are, you know, are, you know what's the role of the extra costs of surveillance or regulation or whatever, and how does that fit in? So kind of, what, what's the equity issue and what's the health issue, and does, does health always trump you know, access to markets and things like that? Lots of poor people would, wouldn't be able to meet all the kind of high-level regulations, but you know, their food is more or less safe most of the time. So, so how do we play you know, those kind of convergence of economics and health, I think, is, is quite, you know, kind of livelihoods and, and, the, and the food safety. Poor people have all kinds of hazards and they're trying to navigate these hazards and, and manage risks. So I think one of the lessons in food safety systems is that we have to think about different issues when we're talking about poor people in, in, in informal markets. So we, we have to look at the kind of trade-offs between their access and income and, and food safety. We need to look at not just regulating them, but building capacity and incentivizing better practices and behavior. But it's really working with people and communities to get that right. So there's, I think it's, um, there's never a kind of ideal situation. And I think that's part of this, 
of what we're painting, and maybe you, Jakob, has more to say about that. But I agree with you that, that this prevention angle, this health is very important, but it often gets quite complicated, I'm afraid. <laughs> uh, Jakob, do you want to? Yeah. I mean, we should be careful with food safety and malnutrition because there might be also myths hanging around. I give you an example, bovine tuberculosis. I'm working since 15 years about that in Africa. And in a meta-analysis, we could show that only about 2%, 2 to 3% of human TB cases are indeed embovis. So that has deconstructed largely many, many uh, myths that say it is such a huge problem. And when we did the economics of bovine TB for Ethiopia, a cow in a rural area loses not more than a dollar per year in, in production from bovine TB. In peri-urban dairy here in Addis Abeba, a cow may lose $20 per year. So here, control may be useful in the peri-urban dairy belts, but in rural areas, it hardly meets the cost of, of an intervention. So we have to be very careful, we have to properly analyze across sectors what these diseases really cause. I don't say we should not fight against bovine TB, but we have to be carefully analyzing that. Now the, the, the last point I want to make is about uh, our experience with peri dairy production in Bamako. There we analyzed the contamination of the milk from the other to the market. It went from 10,000 colony forming units to 20 million on the market. So we introduced simple disin uh, cleaning and disinfection, better calbashes, better containers, and we could get that contamination under one million. That milk could be pasteurized and be conveyed on the urban market. The, the central element there was the, that the community, the, the farmers' association, themselves controlled the quality of the milk. So there was a peer control of quality that provided ultimately access to the market. So I believe very much in this kind of community uh, associations in food safety in, in these situations.